Number two, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only two Patreon supporters, only two Patreon supporters away from achieving our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll also gain access to membership-only content, our private Patreon, members-only Facebook group, and so much more. Again, we are only two Patreon subscribers from hitting this next major milestone, and we will announce where and when our Patreon members only, Patreon members only, meetup will be. It's going to be a massive event with a ton of fishing guides, and it'll be completely free to all Patreon supporters. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have a really special guest, Steve Camboris. On it, from what I've heard of you, you, the legend in the snakehead community, and we're going to be talking about the tournaments that you've had here up with the uh, Virginia Elite Anglers. I love all those guys. I have them on a bunch. And really to set the table with this, Snakehead is so unique because I'm on the the Maryland Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland talking about freshwater policies and stuff. And Maryland has a interesting viewpoint when it comes to snakeheads. Let me see if I can tiptoe around that versus Virginia when you have Odenkirk and and their perspective, like they're here. What are you going to do about it? Kind of because it's kind of my vibe I get with it versus Maryland's kill on site. And we're going to get into this today because I think this is fascinating because I personally think they're here. There's a cult following that's gotten a ton of anglers into this sport because of snakes. So with that all said, Steve, how the hell did you get into this cult? Yeah. So, I mean, I was born and raised Baltimore, Maryland, but I joined the army like straight out of high school back in 2002. So when Snakehead first hit the scene in Maryland, I wasn't even here. I didn't make it back to Maryland until the fall of 2016. And I was doing my normal stuff, man. I grew up as a trout fisherman, bass, crappy, pickerel, striped bass, whatever. It didn't matter. I'll fish for it. I'm a multi-species guy. So my buddy was like, hey, you want to go fishing for a snakehead? I'm like, what the, What is a snakehead? Like, what are you even talking about? And that was back in the summer of 2017. And we went and hit Blackwater. I actually got video of that first trip I ever did snakehead fishing. And I caught five of them between, I would say, about 12 inches up to about... 18 inches and i lost a bunch more the first one i ever caught i had a three inch gulp minnow i had no i didn't know what i was doing i had a three inch gulp minnow on a jig head just hanging off the kayak and a rod holder and i saw the rod tip go down i just kind of pulled up on it and out comes this 15 16 inch snake head lands in my old little sit-in kayak and just flips out i mean he's jumping up in the air like hit me in the chest ran left ran right and shot back in the water and I mean that, and then it's a series of just the chaos that snakehead bring to kayak fishing with their freak outs that hooked me. Like that's the biggest thing about snakehead that have hooked me is the challenge of handling them, the challenge of stalking them, the sound of their hits mm-hmm. and just the wild ways they fight. The fact they can breathe air out of water. They don't lose consciousness. they are a constant handful of planning escape routes. I love the challenge, dude. Like they have great acrobatics and all that too, but I love the challenge of snakehead fishing. I've been hooked since that first trip in the summer of 2017 over in Blackwater, Maryland. Yeah, I haven't stopped since. What has been the evolution of this tribe like? I mean, from an outside perspective as me, I see it as kayaking and snakeheads is peanut butter and jelly it's insane yeah. how both of these seem to pop off around covid but and at least to me that seems like it that was a big part of it because i mean that was one of the things back during covid you weren't supposed to do any kind of gathering indoor activities and even then you're only supposed to fish for sustenance or you know whatever the stipulations were at the time but when you get out there in the kayak and you're outdoors the risk of transmission is extremely low even by the science extremely low so 
a combination of that, people are just bored. And the fact that going in a kayak and chasing snakehead will take you to some of the most beautiful waters you'll ever see in your life. Like the Blackwater area, especially at sunrise on a calm day, is I would have to argue one of the most beautiful places on earth, like no other place I've ever been to before. But the same holds true for a lot of these other types of waters that generally speaking, fishermen didn't used to go to. Mm -hmm. These are waters that have a uniform depth of maybe two at most three feet, thick grass, swamp, <laughs> marshland type environments where normally you might've found small bass before, sunfish, bluegill, now you have up to 10, 15 pound or more exotic sport fish that have colonized these areas. And we can get into the details of, okay, what is their impact versus what's their reported impact and all that kind of jazz. But I think more so what it is, is that in a kayak, it brings you closer to the water level and more immersed in nature than you can possibly be in any sense, aside from actually wet wading in the water. Like mm -hmm. that's as close as you can get to the action. And as important mm. as you can get in nature, I think, you know, relative to any other type of fishing, I just, I don't think you can beat it. It's like, I, I love it. I will still get on boats. I still wade fish. I still do all that. But the other added bonus of the kayak fishing is no ticks and no poison ivy. Cause I, I 32 years old. I don't know what happened. Suddenly I'm extremely allergic to poison ivy. So once that stuff grows up, man, I spend a lot of time in the kayak, dude. I, I, I kiss the shore fishing goodbye. When did the tournament scene it, catch on for snakes? So it actually caught on a few years ago. Um, and one of the pioneer groups out there was definitely Amped Up, the Amped Up Fishing Group. You've probably seen a lot of their stickers around different places in Maryland and Virginia. Great crew of guys. They don't really get into that game anymore. But that's when it really kicked off, I would say, is probably about – Probably about four or five years ago now. I'd have to go back and check and see what my videos say on there for dates and all that kind of stuff. But it was about four or five years ago. Um, then a few different groups have got into running tournaments since then, be it like local fishing shops or groups like VKAE, my team, like Legion of Anglers. And we've put it together over time some pretty awesome trails, you know, like Angler of the Year, Rookie of the Year awards. And... It's, like, it's this kind of balance we're always trying to strike in the snakehead community. Because some folks love to fish for fun. Some folks love to fish for competition. Yeah. Some folks love to fish for both. And like that's something we're always trying to kind of balance out there is to maintain the spirit of the camaraderie and the community and also having that, comp that competitive element. Because I'm a very competitive person, yeah. but not at the cost of just being a jerk and going out there and trying to fight against everyone else for their little fiefdoms and all that. And that's the unfortunate part about it. Like in the snakehead community, by and large, people get along, but then you have the debates that rage and then people try to carve out their little niche within the community. So yeah, it's about four or five years ago. And now I think a lot of the other groups have kind of fallen away and we're establishing some trail series and we're trying to forge as like, you know, as that end game, that more professionalized circuit and standardization that you see with bass fishing. Because I mean, going looking forward in the future, I do think that that's going to happen eventually. Oh. It's just going to take a little bit of time for people to kind of normalize. I've said that in, I've said that in department meetings before where it's like, eventually, when are you going to have a stamp for this? Yeah. Because you're never going to, from a financial standpoint, regardless of invasive species studies, there's enough of a cult following of people with my challenge saying, like, where do I go to catch this thing? Yeah. You don't get that with you don't get that with blue catfish, that that invasive species. But there is such an allure to catch this thing. Mm -hmm. You need to when I'm not saying protect maybe I'm saying protected, I don't know, but like when is this gonna become part of the 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 icon, the zeitgeist of the Maryland Chesapeake Bay watershed, you know? And what it really comes down to, and I always tell people this, we tend to accept as normal that which we're born into. Because, you know, when it comes down to it, are largemouth bass native to the DMV? No. And it goes to the same a lot of other species. Rainbow trout, where are they from? Well, they're from the west coast of the U.S. Brown trout, where are they from? They're from Europe. And you go on the list of a lot of the other sport fish that we really value. We've always considered them as normal because they're naturalized. And that, that's kind of what we call them is like they're naturalized species because they've been in the environment long enough that we kind of remove the invasive label and you build essentially what amounts to an economy around it. And that's, you know, they recently renamed 
Northern Snakehead, the Chesapeake Chana. And as much as that is an effort to increase consumption, what you eventually will do with Snakehead as you increase consumption is you're going to create such a market that you're going to have to make it sustainable. And preach. Yep. I, I don't know when that's finally going to hit critical mass. You know, we definitely have a very passionate following. You know, you'll see petitions fly around, you know, probably every few months saying, hey, we need a career limit. We need a career limit. We need a career limit. And then you got a lot of folks that push back and you're like, no, we're shooting, you know, still dozens a night and we still can't keep their numbers down. The debate rages on, but we are, I think, in probably another 10 years or so, if I had to shoot my estimate out there, I think that'll probably be it because that'll be almost a generation of people who have grown up with Snakehead. Yeah, it, it is about is about that point. I'm glad you brought that up about shooting because like I'm trying to get a couple of bow fishing services on it. And one that wanted to be remain anonymous was you think that, and this is what he said, it was, you think you want, you, we, you want us to kill them all. But the problem is if we killed every snakehead, we would no longer have clientele, you yeah. know? And so we want to start getting selective with what we shoot because we understand that people don't want to just shoot a grass carp. Some people do want to come out and just shoot a snakehead. And that's interesting because Maryland and, and, and sometimes Virginia push so hard for the bow fishermen to do this. But like you said, once you create an economy of, of bow fishing snakehead, they're not going to want to kill what makes them money you know, yeah. to, to an extinction. And the same part goes for, you know, local bait shops and things like that. Then it's going to apply to the restaurants because yeah. I've, I've said that for a long time. Like sometimes you take the snakehead to a cookout and sometimes you got to tell folks that it's striped bass until after they've eaten it. You know, just to get around the whole name of snakehead. But once people get a taste for snakehead, and once that happens in restaurants, yeah, like they're going to be in restaurants ac around the country eventually, and mm -hmm. it, it'll, it'll take a little while for it to spread like that. But eventually, it's going to happen. And it, it's the same story: is that it's just the nature of politics, especially in this country, is that once you have a lobbying group, once you have a group that financially benefits from whatever that thing is. Then you have advocacy, then you have regulation, and then you have protection. We're on the road to that path right now. How long? I don't know. Like I said, maybe 10 years, but we're on that path. I'm blessed that I've had multiple conversations with John Odenkirk, who, who basically led the Snakehead Task Force. And some of the things that we had off, off camera was the fact that in Japan, their view of the snakehead and and like oh you want to get rid of it but on the flip side the largemouth bass is illegal there yep. and the government is trying its absolute darndest to eradicate largemouth from japan i know if, if you're listening viewers this is crazy yep. but this is true and they yep. failed they have yep. habitually failed with the government backing it and there's a cult following of largemouth yeah is that basically what we have going on here with with the snakehead and do you think that's what's going to end up happening is like it's just not going to work yeah, eventually that's the point we're going to get to. Yeah, like it, it, it's going to get to the point where, again, people are just going to become, what would you say, acclimatized to them. Like the, yeah. it's going to come like for the kids growing up fishing on rivers and creeks right now. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit jealous. I didn't get to grow up with snakehead. I'm a little bit jealous. But for those kids, these are a normal fish in our waters. Like that's one more fish that they have fun catching. If they eat it, they know it's great table fare. And like, honestly, I think our waters would be less exciting if snakehead were to disappear. We never will. Like, we'll never, ever, ever get rid of snakehead. We might be able to reduce their numbers in certain areas with a combination of bow fishing pressure and rod and reel because John Odenkirk talked about this. That's demonstrated in the scientific literature. If you have enough pressure, you can drive down the numbers in a given you know body of water yeah. to the point where you can't sample them anymore. But will you ever truly get rid of all of them? Especially on interconnected waterways, the answer is no. It's really just a question of what type of fishery do we want to have? And the more the people get into snakehead fishing, and the more that, you know, whether it's boat fishing or rod and reel, eventually we hit that point where it's like, okay, maybe we will need some kind of protection. Maybe we won't. You know, I've talked to fisheries biologists about this too. And their answer to the question about regulation and creel limits was we don't really know yet how much yeah. pressure is going to result in how much of a reduction in these fish. And at, the, at that time, we really didn't get into the economics of it. But that's kind of what we were looking at. I was asking about what about career limits? What about something like that? And they're like, we need more data. We need more time to study, which I don't necessarily disagree with. I, I, I mean, within the realm of scientific study and longitudinal studies, 20 years is not that much. No. It, uh, it, it's, a, it's a decent data set, but it's not that much. 
we still need more time to study him. So, yeah, and it's hard know. to sample a fish that versus a largemouth or a, a, a catfish on a high tide, depending on where you take the study, like where yeah. they go. You can't really yeah. electrical sample them. Yeah, and if you try to go in there on a low tide in an electrical fishing boat, odds are you're going to bottom out a lot of their, a lot of these water, mm. right? They, I'll t- add to that, they're uh, resistant to the electrical shocks that we use, and they recover very quickly. So it's, that's the other thing I love about snakeheads. They're super tough. But circling back around to your question, yeah, that's it's one of the funny parts. Like here in Maryland, blue crabs are valued greatly, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of other parts of the world, they're called different things like blue swimmers or different things like that. And like in the Mediterranean, for, for instance, they're considered invasive. Like it, it's we grew it's up crazy. as a, we grew up as a culture about picking through blue crabs. So we don't have a problem with it. But a lot of other folks who don't grow up in Maryland. They come here and like you're going to do all that work for this little bit of meat out of this crab. And that's how a lot of folks in the world kind of look at it. But so, yeah, talking about the discussion about how. They're trying to eliminate largemouth in Japan because snake, snakehead are native there. It is funny, man. It, it's it's funny how I don't I don't want to say we shouldn't ever get wrapped around the actual about invasives because yeah. there are there are some invasives that can do a lot of damage and we have that documented in the science. But we also run the situations where a lot of gnashing of teeth for not a whole lot of <laughs> not a whole Agreed. lot of impact tends to pop up, man. It's it, it's interesting. And then you got, like you said, the cult followings that pop up. It's fascinating to watch between cultures. How, with all this said, and, and from my interviews with snakehead winners, uh, uh, you know, for, from the Virginia elites and, and so on, how hard is it to create, to grow the tribe when a lot of anglers are afraid? And I've had this before with people that have come on the show before. It's like, I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm afraid people go in there and kill them all. Yeah. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. I understand that. Does that put up a big wall when you try to get new people to come into uh, the club, so to speak? And to a degree, it does. And this is something that I've really wrestled with with my YouTube channel because mm-hmm. I love to teach. I love to help educate people on tactics, lures, gear, the fish themselves, their biology. I love to teach people all of that. And I love to help people get on the water, get in nature, have a good time, teach their kids. But what you run into is that, especially on social media, you can blow up a spot. And that's real. Like that that's that's part of the conversation we have to accept is that some spots, and I could name a few, have become so well known that tons of people went there, they started over harvesting, and they trashed the place to the point that it's got it's closed now. You no longer can go there, it's closed to the public. And that's real. That's a real risk. It doesn't even get into the next layer of it is like when you get into conversations around the bow fishing, because don't get me wrong. I have buddies. I have friends who bow fish. It's one of the oldest forms of fishing in the world. It is like bow fishing is. Um, But you do have some within the bow fishing community who relish and just absolutely love wrecking the waters and wrecking the time of what I would say are like the recreational like pro snakehead fishermen, the guys who like really value the species. There's, there's some bow fishermen out there who take it as a badge of honor to go out there and wreck that spot. So in terms of bringing new people into the sport, um, I still drive forward with that intent in mind. It's one of the it's one of the favorite things for feedback that I get from my YouTube channel is saying, man, it'll find you forever. I've got my first snakehead. Thank you so much for all the tips. And I, I love that stuff. That's why I do it. But when it comes to like name dropping, especially on smaller waters, I don't do that. And I don't do that for that reason. Like larger waters, like there's some that are so well known, it doesn't matter if I say them. You know, you could say Matawoman Creek on the Potomac. You could say mm. like the Gunpowder River, at Mariner Point Park. Oh, spoilers. Up there. Yeah. 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 Like, like there are some spots that are so well known and are large enough that it doesn't matter if I if I say that name. But there are other waters that me and you know a few other guys know who they definitely keep on the down low. They blur all their backgrounds and their photos because what you really have to appreciate is that there are some waters, and there's few left, but there are some waters you can go to that have so little fishing pressure you can see what a spot looks like for snakehead in that type of condition. And it's it's insane. Like the number of large fish alongside all the other species that are there. It's, it's like I fish waters that have 
virtually no harvest. And I still catch crappy yellow perch, bass. I still flip over rocks, find tons of crayfish, pencil eels. Everything else in the environment was already there, is still there. Um, but it's, it is a difficult balancing act bringing people in. And I feel like at the point at which you bring them in, it becomes incumbent on us as folks who love snakehead to communicate the need for a respect for the resource because that, that's what they are at this point like yeah. if, if we're rebranding them you know to make them more aesthetically pleasing in terms of their name to get them on dinner tables everywhere we're pretty much at that point where this is you know something that's going to be beneficial it's going to be part of kind of fishing culture in the long term and it's going to grow larger because we're working on it, but the first ones who can like kind of turn the snakehead fishing community in these tournaments into kind of like the old school bass masters tournaments where like you have people following on cameras and you yeah. see these hits and these jumps and the action and all that. It's going to be awesome, man. Like I'm really excited for what the future holds for these fish. That really resonates with me when you talk about protecting because it's such a with my channel and everything with I do with largemouth and, and musky and things like that species that are stocked by the state. There is these comments on Facebook about blowing up areas, but to me, it's always been like, well, first off with, with those situations, the state pays to do this. And yeah. if you didn't give them any kind of props, they'll stop doing it. So there's yep. that dilemma, but there is a moral dilemma on your end where it's like, this is not that situation. It's completely different. This is thing that could get easily wiped out, almost like a native brook trout stream, something like that to kind of correlate it for my trout guys. So I, I and that's gotta be a hard line for you guys to follow, especially with, you know, we haven't got into it yet, but your YouTube channel, that's gotta be a hell of a line to toe, man, on YouTube. It, <laughs> that it, really it is. is. It is. And it, it's like, at the end of the day, you really have to decide what your goals are and what your limits are because you're never going to please everyone. Like, I, like if you, 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 it doesn't matter if you, sh you it just, some folks want you to show more, some folks want you to show less, some folks don't want you to make videos at all. I've gotten really good at using the blurring tools inside of my video editing program, <laughs> trying to block out the major identifying land features. But it, it is tough to balance. And I mean, like the way I always approached it in the beginning was, I'll try to leave something akin to a trail of breadcrumbs so that people, if they really do their homework, then hopefully if they do find that spot, they'll value it a little bit more. That, that was my basic rationale is that they have to earn a little bit of it, they'll value it more in the end. And it'd be a lot easier and a lot more profitable for me to just name drop all these locations because that's, you know, the, it's like the number one request you always get. Where can I go for snakehead? Where can I go for snakehead? And I will say this, something that encourages me, one of my more popular videos out there is how to find snakehead spots. And that's where I go through all the tools that you can use, be it Google Earth, the different launch apps and websites to have out there, like Go Paddling, uh, Fish Brain, which, you know, a lot of folks have a problem with Fish Brain. I don't blame them in some respects because Fish Brain is kind of that. It is like an app that if you believe in spot burning, it's kind of what it is. But the point being is that we have a ton of resources available mm. to find fishing spots. And as that's what I do in that video is I just run through it, like use this, use this, use this. And, and again, my goal there is just really to give people the tools they need to do it for themselves. And then hopefully as a consequence of that, they'll value that spot a little bit more because they had to earn it instead of just being given it. How did you go from military to dabbling in snakeheads to having a YouTube channel that's well over 10,000 subscribers. Cause that's a fun story. It's, it's wild, man. <laughs> it's like, so, I mean, I did a tour in Korea. Then I did two tours in Iraq, one tour in Afghanistan. And honestly, I got to a point with my military career, which I loved. Don't get me wrong. I love, I still love military culture to this day. Um, but I ended up resigning my commission as a chief warrant officer to, um, upper promotion on CW3, but that's a different conversation. I got to a point where my young kids and my kids now are 14, 13 and 10. Um, and I got out in 2014. So you, you can knock about 10 years off of all those ages. I didn't want to go through any more deployment cycles. Um, I also had some issues with our foreign policy at the time. That's a different conversation yeah. for a different podcast. But uh, the short of it is that between that and just wanting to spend more time with my family, I ended up resigning my commission. And 
My wife is an MD PhD student. For those at home who don't know what that is, it means she is getting both her medical degree as a doctor and her PhD, her doctorate. She already has her PhD. She is wrapping up her medical degree at University of Maryland here in Baltimore. Law. So point being, we are grounded here in Maryland for a while, which has worked out really well for me. We're both from Baltimore, Maryland originally, so it's nice to be home. And she's doing a residency here. She doesn't have to go anywhere else for a residency or anything. That's to be determined because like, the oh, way no. they the way they break down the program is you do like first two years medical, then you do your PhD, then final two years of medical. So she's she's a uh, third year doing the clinical rotations right now in surgery at the moment. Um, so we are here for a while. That's how I really got back to Maryland was with her medical cool. degree in the pursuit of that over here. So um, <laughs> that's kind of how I ended up here. And then Snakehead, Snakehead just hooked me, man. It's, I still love my bass. I still love my trout, my crappy, everything else out there, bluefish, whatever it is. But Snakehead have turned waters that are near to home They've turned them from waters I wouldn't have given a second look into waters I know I can catch a 10 or 15 pound sport fish who's going to go completely wild off the hook set and challenge me, probably break my gear. I just had one break my lip crippers straight in half the other day. That's cool. It, it, yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's like I love the unpredictability that comes with snakehead fishing. It's, it's, you never know what they're going to do. You know what challenge they're going to pose to you. They'll jump straight out of nets. They'll their vertical right off the ground can be up to three or four feet or more. They're just a wild, explosively powerful fish that always keeps you guessing. I mean, to this day, I'm still trying to learn more about what conditions are best for snakehead. And sometimes you just never know until you go because it's like some days I think it should be fire. It's not. Other days that I think it should be trash. It's fire. It's uh, yeah. Anyone tells you they know everything about snakehead fishing out there, I would question what they're talking about, really, because really, I think a lot of the guys that are really deep in the game know that we still have a lot to learn about these fish. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you haven't even like hit the forward-facing sonar, like Zeitgeist Jet, and no. finding those suspended snakehead. Um, but before we get to that, what made you hit record and start a YouTube channel? That was really... So I was fortunate enough to have parents who got me into the outdoors. And that's really what it comes down to, is that I know a lot of folks out there didn't have a mother or father who know the game, who know the outdoors, or who had time to get them into the outdoors. So that's a big part of why I do what I do, is first showing people how much fun you can have in the outdoors and developing that passion or that excitement for it, and then showing them how to do it as well. Uh, so that was that's really my biggest motivating factor. I mean, it, it's wild what happens after that, like the people you meet and the places you can go, um, the opportunities that kind of open up. That part's wild and it's, it's definitely great. But that was my biggest motivating factor was just to teach. Like I, I'm a teacher at heart. You know, it's I really mm -hmm. almost I almost went for my uh, college education. I didn't touch on that. I was a <laughs> I'm going to get some laughs out here, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm big on philosophy. I was like a double degree in undergrad uh, for sociology and political science. And then I did my master's at Hopkins for public administration. And now I work as a uh, project manager with Siemens and HVAC controls. So worlds apart, like I've, I've done just about everything. I did electronic warfare maintenance when I was in the army, I did the drone program. And then I did this in college and that in grad school. And now I'm over here at Siemens. Worlds apart. It's I, I've sampled a lot of stuff, but getting back to your question, just love to teach, man. That's what got me started on YouTube. I mean, the idea about living a full life is that you're going to be wearing many hats and traveling to many places. Um, Here's hoping. Yeah, it's uh, I, that's the other thing I have on my list is what I call my snakehead world tour, because there are actually 46 different species of snakehead worldwide. Hmm. And I've only caught two of them. So I, I have some work to do. <laughs> Northern and then Eastern. I think it's the Eastern snakehead or the diamond snakehead. I forget the... Northern and the bullseye down in Florida. Bullseye. Yep. Well, what is the biggest one? Is it the bullseye? The biggest one is actually the toman or the giant, the, toman. the giant snakehead over in Malaysia. We've had some aquarium releases here in the United States, but with the exception of like our southernmost states, I don't think there's any waters that can support them. They really need those tropical temperatures to be able to survive. 
Hey, how? One, one, one quick break. I, I hopefully you can edit yeah. this. My phone's about to die. I just want to. Oh, that's fine. It's right here. And. Minute 28. Okay, we're good to go. Minute 28. Perfect. Yeah, that's so interesting. Like, I, I love like those parts of the conversations here. Like, I didn't know there was that many sub uh, Iliads of snakehead. Like, I knew the bullseye, I knew the northern, but I did not know about all those other species. That's so freaking wild, man! It, and the fact that they're really so coveted over there, and they think we're weird with bass, but then you go over to different places and you're like, you want to get rid of these? Why? It's yeah, it's. I wish that we could more so judge these different species on their merits i mean their merits as well as any damage that they do Let, let's talk about both sides of the equation but i th I, I think you are hard pressed to find another sport fish that has as many positive qualities in fresh water as snakeheads do and you know to the degree to which that they're impacting local economies and local species i get that and that should be addressed. But the point I always go back to is when people start talking about what's native and what's not, I have to ask the question, what's your baseline? Like, wh like what, what is your baseline for where you would like to see these waters? Is it 50 years ago? Is it 100 years ago? Is it 150 years ago? Because the farther you go back, the more radically different our waters are. You're like, Fair enough, yeah. It, now, it, it, doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that just because we've changed so much in the past that we should continue to change so much in the future. I'm not going to make that argument. I'm just saying that we should be aware of how radically different we've already changed our current waters and how we've come to accept a lot of those changes prior to snakehead. Yeah, no, I, it's just, I will go down these rabbit holes all day long because it comes like invasive species like hydrilla. Like at what point yeah. is hydrilla actually not a, when should it not be classified as an invasive versus... <laughs> The grasses that are in your lawn that we accept every day, that's technically an invasive species brought over here by by the settlers, but we accept that as an invasive species. Yep. It, it, it's fascinating to me why, and this is where I need to get another biologist on to really get into this, like, can you get things knocked off of the invasive species list? I mean, if it's here a thousand years, is it still invasive? When is it not an invasive anymore? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's it, it's a rabbit hole, like you said. Like, like I, I don't mind going down those rabbit holes. I love those kind of discussions, but I just I wish more people were were aware of <laughs> exactly what is native or not native to this particular area or our particular homes. With all this said, for people that aren't aware of a snakehead tournament. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's some people in my audience that are 100% in the zeitgeist, but I want to just make sure I touch on the people that are kind of just just window shopping. Is this your best five catchway release, like a bass kayak tournament? Is this, uh, I'm assuming it's catchway release and not kill on site, but like just, just go through that for people yeah. that aren't, aren't aware of it. So there's a few, it depends on the tournament trail, first of all. Uh, VKAE and Legion of Anglers, we are catch photo release. And there are particular standards for that. Uh, there's particular bump boards that are usually permitted. And that's because some bump boards will flex or bend in the middle much more than others. Some are more easily read than others. But to keep it nice and succinct and short here, there's a lot of standards that go into these photos to make sure that everyone's completing a, on a level playing field and standards are being adhered to by everyone involved. But it really depends on the tournament. Um, a lot of tournaments for VKAE, it was the top three longest snakehead. That was your main bag. And then you'll have Calcutta's for longest snakehead, longest bass. Uh, Legion of Angler tournaments up here are usually the same way, except we usually have top five longest snakehead uh, because usually, not always, but usually it's easier to catch numbers of snakehead up here in Maryland. So we, we usually have a, a larger bag limit than down in Virginia. As I usually, it's not always the case. There's some waters in Virginia that I won't name that I know there are a ton of snakehead in, but a lot of the more pressured waters, if you can put together a three fish stringer, that's probably going to put you in the top, you know, at least half of the competitive field, especially on days where you have the sun and all that kind of stuff. But it is, yeah, catch footer release. There have been some in the past that are angler's choice. In those cases, they normally still require you to measure the snakehead on the board for the photo before it's dispatched, before clubbing it. 
or however you dispatch that fish. Um, with the main idea being, we are aware of the fact that having a catch photo release tournament for snakehead in a kayak is probably the most difficult way you can do it as an angler. Because trying to handle a live snakehead <laughs> anywhere, anywhere yeah. is a chore. But trying to handle a live snakehead in a kayak and get a photo with them alive, not having been hit or anything else, it can be a real challenge. It can be a They real don't play challenge. nice. They, they do <laughs> not play nice. It can be a real chore. But that's something that we love about it. Anyone in that game, yeah. you, you got to love it. You have to love that challenge. I, it, I, I, <laughs> I really do. How would you set it up for a more Bass Masters type tournament trail? Would you do your best three, best five? What, in your perfect role, what would it be? In my perfect world, it'd be best five. Um, I still like the idea of photo-based check-in versus weight. Now, that being said, do I think Snakehead could take it? Yeah, sure. Snakehead are super tough fish. As long as you have some space in that live well for them to be able to surface and breathe air, Snakehead should be fine. They're very, very tough fish. But that, that is one point people would have to account for if you wanted to do a, a live weigh-in check-in, is that they have to be able to breathe atmospheric oxygen, otherwise they literally will die eventually. Um, but for me personally, I prefer to do the photo-based check-in. It doesn't have the same spectacle as a live weigh-in, but I feel like it tends to be better for the fish. Because I, I know they've done studies on largemouth with it, where during tournaments, they've looked at the dispersal of fish as they're released from the check-in point, from the weigh-in point. A lot of those fish, from at least from the studies I've read, do not redistribute themselves across the body of water. A lot of them hang out in or around that general region or area in which they were released. So to the degree to which I could mitigate the impact of the tournaments on that given body of water, I would like to. That's why I favor photo-based check-in, but a five fish bag sounds good to me. And the one thing I, I do like to add in our tournaments as we go around is a Calcutta. If there's any fish that are specific to that area that we think we might get as bycatch, I like to have those Calcutta. It just makes it fun, man. It's like, like if folks want to just kind of get kind of silly with it. Cause I, sometimes you'll be catching 12, 13 inch white perch off chatter baits when you're trying to catch yeah. naked. And it, it's just fun to have those little Calcuttas and side pots there to be able to buy in if you want and then you get to make fun of everybody back at the actual award ceremony who didn't buy in who actually would have won had they bought in <laughs> or bought in rather it's fun <laughs> i love doing that <laughs> no that, that's a, yeah that's a lot of fun and you guys again link in the episode description to this episode if you guys want to join any of these clubs because it, it is an absolute blast to do this and the side pots are awesome i know more bass clubs now that fish the potomac and the upper bay they do side pots for snakeheads all the time because it is it's a fun little thing to get into it <sighs> It's interesting to look at the range and the evolution of this. For, for me here at Fishing the DMV, we basically do a fishing report on every body of water in Virginia and, and, we, and of course, Maryland. And to watch the range explode where allegedly they're in the Shenandoah River, the Upper Potomac, Lake Anna, Occoquan Reservoir. I still think the Rappahannock will be the place the next big record gets busted. But is it all? do you think it's always going to be a chesapeake bay estuary fish or do you think some lakes will start popping off some nice ones as the range expands and i'm talking more of an environmental thing can a lake actually produce a good one so i think it'll come down to the lake and the reason i say that is and this is not, this gets into the question of impact as well i think snakehead will thrive the most in bodies of water that are mostly shallow that have plenty of vegetation okay if you can put together those factors and then couple it with a body of water or an environment that doesn't have a lot of established top level predators, snakehead are going to flourish. Now, does that mean that body of water is necessarily going to produce absolute tanks? Not necessarily. It comes down to the forage base as well. Uh, there's one, one particular area I fish on the upper bay here, which is very limited access, you know, gate controlled access. And as a result of that, there is no commercial harvest whatsoever. Mm. I, don't, I don't care if it's crabs, perch, whatever else is commercially harvested. They literally can't touch these waters. And there's very, very little harvest of the snakehead because, again, there's only a very limited amount of real estate you can even fish in this area. And that particular area... Because of that, because of the lack of pressure, because of the lack of development, you know, there's very little development around there. There's a lot of preserved shoreline and wetlands. 
that has some of the thickest snakehead I've ever seen. You know, I've caught 32 mm -hmm. inches out there that weigh 14 plus pounds, you know, and 33 inches that weigh 16 pounds. I mean, absolute just torpedoes, just thick for days, these fish. So it comes down to the forage base and it comes down to preferential structure and depth in my, in my opinion. Um, there's things you can tinker around the edges with that. Like if you're harvesting more of the smaller fish, it'll actually provide more forage left over for the larger fish. I do think that there are, you know, bound bodies of water, be they lakes or reservoirs, who will produce some tank size snakehead. But I think there are certain qualities of those waters that will determine which bodies of water produce the fish, those big fish the best. You mentioned something there that's that just made me rethink everything where it's it's the pressure from commercial fishing and bow hunting. And if if that is the biggest player, I mean, Lake Anna, you're not going to have a bunch of bow fishing boats in those million dollar communities. You're not going to have industrial fishing. So I think that's something that maybe it's not the best environment, but it's not going to get the same pounding that a lot of these tidal rivers do. A hundred percent. Interesting. Yeah, I, I go out of my way to try to find waters that I don't think are heavily bow fished. If I know waters are heavily bow fished, I generally don't go there because I just, <laughs> I, I know what it usually means, man. Mm. And I, it's like, I, I've heard through the chain, there are some bow fishers who are beginning to complain that certain areas are coming up dry and mm. you know, they're having to hit new waters to try to find those snakehead or, or they're starting to shoot gar, which is unfortunate. Gar are native species. Uh, you can talk to a few different biologists I've talked to out there who are a little concerned about how many gar are being shot. Um, but it's, uh, it, it'll go on the debate around, you know, the boat fishing will go on. But with that said, they can't bow hunt certain lakes, right? Is there rules Correct. against that? So yeah. Okay. That's what I was getting at where they will be naturally protected there. Even though if it's not the best habitat, they won't have the same pressure, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if there's been a carve out or not, but for instance, there is no bow fishing allowed in Anne Arundel County in Maryland. Hmm. Now, that being said, there could have been a carve out made that I'm not aware of by, you know, by now, but I know historically bow fishing isn't allowed within that county, all that county's waters, and there's some good waters there. With with that said, do you well, still think and this is the hot one and I'm talking about region the Maryland and up part of the Bay and estuary will produce the next big record. Or do you think Virginia will eventually be able to take that title? Uh, I mean, I, now mind you, I did, I did host the black bass summit for Virginia where they talked about all their title fisheries and we got mm -hmm. fish shocking. So I feel like if I had to put house money, some of those rivers aren't tapped, but you're in ground central baby. Like you are where it all began. So yep. I almost don't want to dethrone the King. <laughs> it's, I, I think, again, it really comes down to a combination of forage base and pressure. And with that being said, I do think that the mid to upper bay, and I'm going to be kind of cryptic here for, mm -hmm. for good reason. The mid to upper bay, there are some waters around that I do strongly believe have records like world record fish sitting in it right now. That's like I, impressive with all the yeah. pressure it's gotten. And that's the thing. It's like you have to find those waters that I don't want to give away too much here, but you got to find those waters that yeah. are, that are not being pressured, that are not well known, and that have the structure that snake head like and flourish in. And it's like I've talked to my buddies. I've seen some fish that are borderline. I have some buddies who have seen some fish. Buddies I trust, you know, and not not fish storytellers. Buddies I trust who are adamant that they have seen definite world record fish swimming around and i mean they're, they're smarter fish you gotta really you know the stars have to align for you to have that shot at that fish when it's hungry but they is it just to unique to the chesapeake then like it's like could this work in the carolinas and the sounds there and some of those estuaries or is it just maryland's just got the right sauce oh no it, eventually they'll be everywhere eventually okay. eventually they'll be everywhere and there'll be larger specimens i think than what are even in maryland right now jesus <laughs> because it's and it's natural for an invasive species in a novel environment to attain higher um body mass length whatever the measurements are than their native range that that's pretty well mm -hmm. documented in the literature 
But, I mean, I know they've made it into the Mississippi River Delta. Not, not Delta, sorry. Into the drainage system for the Mississippi. Yeah. Which means that eventually they will colonize virtually all of the United States. And, and that doesn't even take into account people intentionally introducing them. Mm. Like Snakehead themselves have an instinct to expand their range like nothing I've ever seen. Like they will jump up waterfalls if if land is flooded. They will traverse the land like salmon. Like they are a wild, wild, wild species. And it doesn't take many to be introduced because, I mean, I, I can't give away the, the ponds and Ashburn's names because I will be shot if I leave the house. But like there are ponds in Ashburn that they didn't naturally get in there. We all know that. And but it also it's so interesting. It doesn't take many. It really no. doesn't to get their population to pop off. It, it, it doesn't. And it's the kind of thing where it's like, you'll, you'll see a few, you'll see a few for a couple of years and all of a sudden, woof. and that's, that's kind of what they call invasion dynamics is yeah. you'll have that initial, like they're colonizing, colonizing, colonizing. And then you have enough mating, make mature fish and mating pairs to shoot that population through the roof. And then you usually see it come back down and get to like more of an equilibrium level. But, uh, yeah, that, that explosion happens. I mean, that reminds me of the stories I heard about Mad Woman back in the 2011, 2012 time frame. Like from what I hear from my buddies who were here, is I was still down in Georgia, my last duty station. But from what I hear, Mad Woman used to be a snakehead mecca. You know, since then, you know, at nighttime, it looks like a series of baseball diamonds with all the bow fishers, and, and they've definitely thinned them out. There's, you, can, you can still catch them there, but they thinned them out. You really can. I mean, I just know that from Bass Guys, but it's not the same. It's not what it used to be. Um, but that also gets into an interesting question. When you guys hold tournaments, and this is something I, I should have brought up with the guys at, at, at NVKE, is how do you pick the waters to make it fun, but you're not giving away like the juice, so to speak? You know, I, I'll say there's one factor that kind of makes it easier for us to decide. Um, first point is that we do generally speaking now only do single point launch tournaments. It's great for the camaraderie. You can come after the event, hang out, award ceremony, snacks, drinks. What it also does is it creates a more level playing field for everyone involved. Because like virtual tournaments, when you can pick your own waters and you're on an honor system, you don't know where anyone's fishing and you're just a lot of issues there. Yeah. But getting to your question about how I pick the location, honestly, it comes down to logistics, man. It's like once you get up into the realm of 30, 40, 50 uh, participants, which is where we're at now, there's only but so many places you can go that can actually support that in terms of parking, for instance. So it's like we'll hit some of these bigger waters and I, I won't give away names here, but I know like there is they have struggled. I, I know folks, guys out there who have hosted tournaments who have struggled. Like, do I hold a tournament here? Because once I yeah. do hold a tournament here. Anyone following us is going to know Pandora's it, box. Is going to know what's up. So we wrestled with that a little bit for our Upper Bay tournament um, because a it was a little bit unfamiliar waters. I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with the Upper Bay like some guys are, and B, you know, where there was parking, like there's one or two spots we didn't necessarily want to take everybody to because we know what's up. And we know how fast they can get blown up and thinned out. But eventually we found a, a kind of a happy medium for the place that we selected up there. It's, uh, well, yeah, I will say a lot of it comes down to logistics, man. Like it, it's either you have the parking to accommodate 30 to 50 anglers or you don't. That's got to be stressful for you, though, when you, if you've ever organized these tournaments to be mm -hmm. like, okay, the Potomac, Rappahannock, Upper Bay no duh but then it's like oh should we go here like uh, i don't know yep. but then the blowback where you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't yeah it's um it, it really has been a point of stress for me uh the one thing i will say is that in areas that i expected more blowback i haven't really we haven't really gotten it not not to the degree hmm. not to the degree i thought we would it, more folks seem to be more excited about participating in most cases which is cool to see because i mean a lot of guys out there like to keep it really simple. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I definitely understand keeping tournament format simple because you just want to keep it fun. I get it. But if we ever want to see Snakehead with the kind of respect that, you know, bass get in terms of the professionalization of their tournament systems, 
there's certain standardization that we have to be able to, you know, adopt within the snakehead community. But, you know, over time, folks are really stepping up to it. And I'm really happy to see it, man. I mean, but it's such an emphasis because we talked about earlier in the show, um, and I've had a couple of other winners on from from this year's uh, Virginia Elite Anglers mm-hmm. tournaments, and we talked about like forward facing sonar and how like it's 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 basic now, but the evolution is, I think, a vast majority of the snakehead population is not being tapped. I've yeah. caught fish when I was in bass tournaments that I would drop to them in ten feet of water. That was a snakehead I saw, and that's fascinating to me. Like they don't do what we necessarily think they do. Very true, man. Very true. It was uh, it was last year's VKE trail. We went to the Rappahannock. And I happened to get there. I wasn't familiar with it. I think that was either the first or at best the second time I'd ever fished that location. And I went up into the stereotypical snakehead structure. So the spatter dock, the pad fields. But it was a low tide or an out- it was outgoing tide at the time. And there just wasn't enough water. The water gauge was too low. And these pads were too shallow to hold fish. And I'm like, what the hell am I going to do now? So I'm working my way out. And eventually I hit this one point. And this creek is emptying out past this point. I can see the current going up past the point itself into the main stem of the river. And then I see a blow up off the point. And I'm like, that looks like a snakehead. And he, they're not on stereotypical snakehead structure. There's no hydrilla, or at least not any visible hydrilla. There's no visible vegetation. I'm like, you know, let me go over here and make a few casts. And I get a short strike right at the boat. I saw him, like a 26, 27-inch snakehead, bit short, turned, and ran off. And I'm like, okay. And then I anchored up, started chucking an American snakehead custom spinner bait at this point. And I landed, I think, six off that point and lost three more. And generally speaking, that is not a tactic I use for snakehead. Hmm. But down there on the Rappahannock in particular, the snakehead seemed to be adopting a deeper water pattern and i'm saying deeper water for snake i'm talking you know relative instead of you know six inches to two feet down there they might be in three feet down to seven or eight right and just my theory just my theory what i think is happening down there is that those snakehead that are genetically predisposed to inhabit the deeper waters and again deeper waters for snakehead they tend to survive and reproduce and those snakehead who tend to do what stereoty- what stereotypically snakehead do go to the shallows and the creeks and the pads a lot more of those fish are getting picked off by the bow fishermen so it's kind of creating a dynamic for natural selection if you want to call human pressure natural selection yeah for those fish that relate more to deeper water to reproduce and successfully survive but yeah the rappahannock in particular is one that I really love fishing for lots of reasons. I love that river in general, but in particular, because I have to adapt my tactics down there. And some days shallow water is a ticket. Some days shallow water is a ticket. Some days it's not. I really want to see if that can be scientifically proven because I know God is my witness. I flipped to a fish in about eight feet of water over 10, and it was a snakehead that I caught on a drop shot, thought it was a bass. Yep. If they do that because of the pressure, it completely null and voids the bow fishing argument to an extent of, and what I mean by that is they can wipe them all out. No, because yeah. they have figured out how to evolve past that. And then the argument by the state is kind of done at that point. It, when it comes to the state, the state's eventually going to have to decide whether they're going to maintain a control posture or whether they're going to treat this as a fishery. We have other fisheries that are very focused on harvest. Striped bass, for instance, which hasn't done wonders for the striped bass, you know, fishing stock. So that's a different conversation for another time. But snakehead, I would agree, even as someone who loves snakehead and releases a lot of snakehead, I will admit that snakehead can take more harvest pressure than most other species out there. Like the only other ones I think can take more pressure than snakehead are probably blue cats. And the state's going to have to decide eventually because I, I think there's a lot of untapped potential in ecotourism for northern, oh, God, yeah. for northern snakehead yes. fishing. And I mean, th- there's a double, it's a double sided sword with everything, whichever side of the fence you're on. It's like they want to encourage fishing for snakehead. Well, you've done that and you've gotten folks like me into it. And then the double edged sword is that you get yahoos like me 
who are like going to preach the gospel of snakehead to anyone who will listen, right? To the mm -hmm. So you, you got me there to fish for him as a control mechanism. Now I want to see them treated as a resource and a valuable resource at that. So it's a, uh, it's, it, there's always trade-offs in public policy, man. There's always a trade-off. It's a, uh, but yeah, eventually Maryland will have to decide, do they want to view this as a resource and treat it as a resource and tap into ecotourism and things like that? Or do they want to continue to maintain the posture of maximum harvest for the time being? And it, for the time being, I think that's going to be the answer is maximum harvest. Yeah. And time will tell to see how this thing will shift because it will. Because I just I believe in I believe in capitalism and greed. And if they can make money off of ecotourism, yep. that's I, I have so many people on my show just out of all the species I cover from the trout, bass, striper, muskie, mm -hmm. the snakehead comes up the most. Cause that, and what's funny is it's the group. Musky anglers are special because that's a, that's a hell of a cult, but that's oh. a very enclosed cult. But randos want the <laughs> right. snakehead. And, and that's, but that's everyone. That's the biggest demographic. Yep. And snakehead has captured that better than any other species, which is fascinating to me. Yep. Yep. I, I just, it's a killer combination, man. They're, they're wild fish to just look at. They're really cool looking fish to look at. They're one of the most graceful fish you'll ever see swim in the water. Beautiful scale pattern. Beautiful scale pattern. And, and then once you see two things, one is the courtship rituals between a male and a female, how they intertwine, rub on each other, guard their fry. I think it's really admirable what they do as parents. You don't see that too often in the fish community. And on top of that, if you're lucky enough to see two big bull snakehead circling each other and then attack, and you see two big bull snakehead fighting, you talk about cool, man. Like like the water just erupts. Like when, when you catch snakehead and their dorsal fins or their anal fins or their tail fins are all torn up or missing, that's usually why. It, it's it's not that's always crazy. yeah, it's not always from an osprey or a heron or an eagle. A lot of times it's from snakehead straight up fighting. It's it's wild to see that. They're, the hit, the sound they make when they take on top water is awesome. It's really cool also on a subsurface hit to see the bubbles come up when they, you know, use that vortex to suck in whatever it is they're trying to eat. And then you're dealing with the acrobatics off the hook set and then trying to handle them. And then once you actually, you know, subdue the fish and if you choose the harvest that you taste it from start to finish. Yeah. There's just, there's just so much fun to be had with this fish. And it's so accessible. That's the other thing. It's like snakehead will take waters that previously you, you might have gone to and, kept and caught like 10 to 12 inch bullhead catfish. And now you have a delicious sport fish that's going to, you know, test your gear and your skills to its limits. That's within reach of everybody. Like it, it, at a time when it's like resources feel like they become limited or, you know, people need food or something like that. I mean, snakehead could be seen as a godsend, man, you know. It's not, that, it's not to say we should rug sweep anything that they're actually having an impact on. I'm not saying that. I am saying that there are a lot of positive qualities around this species. Dude, I mean, I don't even know where we go with hearing the conversation because I feel like we covered it all. I mean, how we, we didn't even get into your damn tournament, but I, I don't yep. know what else we could even say about that. I mean, you, you kicked ass. Um, I, how, how do you pre-fish for something like this compared to a bass, I guess? Like, it, is that hard to do? Do you want to? lean on a bunch of them before the tournament or yep so the it's you need to know the fish is what it comes down to and, I, and again i'll be the first to admit i still have a lot to learn about snakehead because we all do but i don't fish virginia waters that often and honestly with everything i have going on in life between work and family i really don't have time to pre-fish like i would like to so what it really comes down to one, it does help to have a network. It helps to have a network of anglers that you talk with and, you know, you can find out roughly what's going on in that body of water. The other thing is doing your homework and knowing the fish. Like I, I spend a lot of time before all these tournaments going through Google Earth, especially Google Earth desktop version where you can go through and look at the historical photos in a given area. A lot of folks don't know about that. Then they use the Google Earth that's online, but to my knowledge, the Google Earth that's online doesn't allow you to go back in time and look at October 2014 or September 2017. On the desktop version, you can do that. And you can scroll through different times of year to see vegetation growth. You can scroll through different types of water levels. And sometimes it will expose different riverbeds and all this different kind of structure, be it timber or otherwise. 
but I spend a lot of time doing my homework that way. And I generally know with at least a fair degree of certainty where snakehead will be at a given time of year, where they are in their spawning cycle, and what type of structure they prefer. And once you have that information, you can use things like Google Earth to have a pretty educated guess, factor in your tides and things like that. But I think that has what is what really has made me successful this year is the amount of homework I've done before I go. Is and I'm looking at, you know, water gauge levels, comparing that to my last trip there, judging where the water level is going to be on these different types of structures. Is it going to be too shallow in these pads? Well, on a low tide, yes. On a high tide, no. And these are the kind of questions that I'm planning my day throughout, or planning th like in my head, what I'm going to do at different points of the day based on tide or cloud cover, things like that. So do your, that's really what I would say is do your homework. Um, of course, have a checklist for all your gear, you know, when you pack up the night before so you don't forget anything, like check it off as you put it into your vehicle or whatever. But more than anything, I would say do your homework based on the conditions and the structure, the tide, the skies, the wind. All of that's huge. And that's what really helped me be successful this year. And we've talked about this on the show. Like, Google, guys, if you don't know, Google Earth Pro, Google that, Google Earth Pro, and that will pop up. It is very important to have that to be able to go back in years. Yep. So you get there. Great homework before you get to the water. In bass fishing, if we're, if we're doing a pre a site fishing tournament, you can go down the bank, you can see what you're looking for for the tournament. Mark them. You're not sticking these fish, you know they're there. With snakes, and let's specifically say we're targeting the shallow ones, you can get a sense if they're there without making a cast. In a, in a pre-fishing day, let's say if you're at home or whatever in water that you know, yep. how many do you want to catch on a Friday or Thursday before a Saturday tournament versus to be like, they're here, we're good. I don't have to check the size. Like, wh where do you fall on that? Where I fall on that is I'm not going to try and put hooks to too many fish in that situation. Like, once I identify what structure they're on and what time of day and at what tide, that's the information I need. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, I may look into a little bit deeper and make sure conditions aren't going to radically change between pre-fishing and the actual fishing day because wind direction is huge. Um, I think that's one of the biggest differences between bass fishing and snakehead fishing is the wind. Uh, you can still you can still have a really good day bass fishing in some fairly high wind if you know what you're doing. With snakehead, I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why. They hate windy days. They just, generally speaking, they shut down. And one of the only ways that I found to reliably mitigate that is to check the wind direction and then look for the convergence of two factors. One is a shoreline with trees that can shield the wind based on that wind direction. Two, make sure the structure immediately along that shoreline from that shielded shoreline is what I would consider snakehead structure. Because I mean, like there's days where like I've gone out there and I'll catch 20 bass on a windy day in an area where I know for a fact it is filled with snakehead and I won't get a single snakehead bite. I think it affects their ability to breathe, being air breathers with the chop. That's true. That, that's a great point, man. Honest, honestly, dude, I hadn't considered that. And that makes a lot of sense because when snakehead are feeding heavily, you generally see them also breathing heavily. So yeah, that... That makes a lot of sense, man. That makes a lot and, of sense. And for people that don't know, like they do have to breathe oxygen to survive. And so if that theory is right, it's like a snorkel without that splash guard. Like they're not going to be able to suck in the oxygen needed to be very, to the full apex predator. Interesting. That's huh. a great point. That's wild. What a cool ass fish. It was really, I know, really man. It, it, it's, and we're still, we'll be learning about them for many, many years to come. We're still learning about bass at this point. So we got a long way to go with snakehead. Yeah, yeah, and then that that freaking rabbit hole of crap we're going down with jigging minnows and forward facing sonar, which I'm fascinated to see how that affects the snakehead community when they can start watching them honestly it, on the scope. And that's what I'm waiting to see. And it's it's a thing where like I know some guys had been using it already, and honestly, it's like me personally, I hate to see it. I'd rather us not go down that same road. But I know there are certain applications for it within snakehead fishing, like on deeper water environments, where I know that if someone masters that, they're going to kick butt in those tournaments. 
Now, in other environments where, like, you know, we're fishing hydrilla mats and pad fields and stuff like that, I don't know how effective it's going to be there. Um, but in those environments that have a little bit deeper water, where you're fishing secondary channels and things like that, the first person to master that, I think, is probably going to be running away with a few tournaments. I do. Okay. Steve, I really appreciate you coming on today and giving some of your time. I know you're super busy. Um what do you have coming up that we can promote and then also uh, get, let's make sure we really push your YouTube channel. Yeah, sure. So the next tournament we have with Legion of Anglers is going to be our upper bay tournament on Turner's Creek. There are some monsters up there. Uh, one gentleman <laughs> guy named Brady actually went there when we were supposed to have a tournament last time. He didn't get word that it was canceled until he was out there. And he caught like a 37 incher. So, I mean, a, a big snakehead. There's some big fish in there. So, that's going to be on this Sunday, the 28th. Is that Sunday? Yeah, I think it's 28th. It's, I got to look at my calendar. Um, that's our most uh, close tournament. Our next one after that is going to be the championship. And that's going to be in August. And I want to say that one's going to fall on is that the 18th. Let me check my calendar. 17th, I think. But you can find all this information on the Legion of Anglers on Facebook on our event page. Or you can look us up on the Fishing Chaos app. Um, and for folks out there who are looking for any kind of fishing tournament, snakehead or otherwise, you have Fishing Chaos, you have Tourney X, a bunch of other options out there. Um, aside from that, let's see what other big events do we have that are coming up. Uh, VKAE is done for the year. We just had our last round out there. That was a great trail series. And... I guess, yeah, other than that, I would just say go ahead and watch the Legion of Anglers event page because <laughs> it's the only thing that's killing me right now is time. But we just want to do some kind of meetups as well and just get folks out there, show them how to tune in bait casters, kind of guide them around the water, show them where to cast, what to look mm -hmm. for, stuff like that. So if you're not already, uh, make sure you're following uh, me, Cambo Trout, on Facebook. A uh, YouTube channel, same thing, Cambo Trout. You can see it actually on the name behind me up here. <laughs> and other than that, uh, Legion of Anglers on Facebook. Check out our event page. And, well, hopefully we'll see you on the water. Steve, again, thank you so much for coming on. And then, guys, a link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. I know we're going to be having James Hall on the show. We're going to have uh, Giuseppe on the show again to talk about the right. Virginia Kayak Anglers Elite season. Uh, there's some great hammers there. There, there are some really good sticks. Uh, and so we'll make sure we cover this all. Any questions, please feel free to email me, fishingdmb at gmail.com. Check us out on Apple and Spotify. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. Bye, y'all. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.